I'm here today with Associate Professor Michael from Cabrini Hospital. Uh, Michael, we're going through an interesting time. Uh, can you please take me through uh, what you do at Cabrini and how that sort of fits into the current climate? Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me. Um, You're welcome. I'm the Director of the Emergency Department uh, at Cabrini and I'm also um, uh, Director of uh, Medical Services for all the Diagnostics and Pharmacy, so um, uh, um, Radiology, Pathology and, and those services as well. Um, yeah, I've been there for some years now, about nine years now, and um, I guess in the current climate, um, most of the work and activity, um, apart from day to day, um, has been around preparation for for the um, the COVID nineteen pandemic that's um, kind of reached our shores. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's it's an interesting time, as I mentioned. And what are, what are you seeing essentially? Um, so it it's it's a really fluid situation, and it's changing day to day, and it's a little hard to predict. Um, certainly we have some frameworks and guides um, that take us from now, say, till May and, and give us an idea of what will be coming our way in that time, you know, best case, worst case. Um, and, but day to day, um, we're finding um, it's very hard to predict what's going on. Most of our work really is preparatory. Um, everything to do with COVID so far has mainly been around um, testing and screening. Uh, a lot of tests have been done, thousands of tests have been done, and, and we have only had um, you know a few hundred nationally that are positive, very few in Victoria. Um, I can't tell you exactly how many tests Vidral has done. That's the one lab that does the tests, yep. although there's an expansion of those labs coming. Um, very shortly, but it would be in the tens and tens okay. of thousands, and we've probably had a um, hundred or two hundred positives. Sure. So the positive rate at the moment is very low. Yep. Uh, of those positives, um, we've had uh, a few at Cabrini. Uh, they've all been mildly unwell, so no one's been particularly um, terribly sick with it sure. so far. But um, we're talking very small numbers at this point. Sure. Mm. Now, there's one question that's been plaguing me, yeah. um, and that's uh, obviously it's important for people to go in and, and have tests and to have screening because it gives um, doctors like yourself the the opportunity to to do more research research around that. But if people aren't well and they're going and hanging around a group of people that are unwell. Isn't that a risk of actually inflating the numbers or am I missing something? Yeah, it, it takes a little while to catch this off someone. Yep. Um, okay. it, it's not like uh, you might see in a movie where you brush past <laughs> someone and a little bug suddenly enters you and starts to um, proliferate. You know, the, the current uh, feeling is you've got to have at least 15 minutes, you know, closer than we are now. Sure. Uh, under a meter and a half away, what we're calling direct contact uh, for 15 minutes plus. Okay. Uh, so walking around the community, walking past someone in a hospital, it's not going to happen. Right. Okay. Um, and that's why all the, there's all that hand wash around. The bug can live on surfaces. Um, Is a, a certain time frame that, that it depends on the surface okay. and the, what the surface is made of. Yep. So there's been a few publications around, you know, wood, uh, copper, steel, plastic, cardboard. They all have. Di it, it's got a different lifespan on different surfaces. Um, uh, the it, it's impossible to know if that surface is contaminated. Most surfaces in hospitals are cleaned reasonably regularly. Um, the, the lowest lifespan, we're talking uh, one to two hours on those materials up to, you know, one to two days on some other materials. That's why you wash your hands. Yeah. Um, so soap and water kills it. Yep. Um, probably a little bit better than those alcohol washers, actually. Really? They're just a little easier to, you know, they're quick and easy. You don't need a tap. Yep. Um, but if you're, um, if you're really keen, Go and wash your hands with soap and water. Sure. <laughs> uh, both both kill it, um, 
So that's why they're dotted all over hospitals, all over clinics. It's just you touch something, you wash your hands. Yep. Try not to touch something. Um, touching it, this was all covered in COVID. I'm not going to catch COVID. Okay. That, that's not how you catch it. That's how you catch it, right? Touching your eyes, touching your nose, touching your mouth. Try not to do that. Yep. Yeah. So when you're in environments now, um, especially environments where the ill are likely congregate. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Clean your, clean your hands. Don't touch your mouth or nose or eyes and you're not going to catch it. Um, it's very different for healthcare workers because there's people coughing on them yeah. uh, and they need to wear and, and um, have very, very different approaches to how they protect themselves than, than members of the community. Um, certain hospitals are, you know, we've instituted this mechanism whereby if you do have a cough, um, you don't come in, you, you call, we've given you a number to call from the outside and sit and wait until someone comes out and brings you a mask. Okay. Um, masks are in pretty short supply. <laughs> yeah, so I've heard. Yeah, there's, um, there's a good central procurement now through the Department of Health, which is good. Um, but um, the, the very effective um, masks that filter um, uh, a high proportion of the viral load, the N95 masks, um, you don't want to be throwing them around willy-nilly. You certainly don't want to be leaving a box of it outside your hospital because um, they've sprouted legs and disappeared lately. I see. Yeah. I see. So we need to have a mechanism whereby we can um, ration them and use them um, when they're really needed. Um, and can, can they be reused or are they a one-time use mask? They're a one-time use for you. Yep. Yeah, uh, if, if you're, depends, if you're um, a healthcare worker, um, you don't wear the same mask for the next patient that you go and yeah. see because it's it may be contaminated on the outside, You so you've got to take it off with gloves on, dispose of it, dispose of the gloves, wash your hands and go get another one for the next person. Sure. If it's just for you, um, again, depends on what environment you put yourself into because um, the mask can get contaminated. So you've got to be careful how you take the mask off, washing your hands after you've taken the mask off. Yep. Yeah. Sounds like I need a bit of a delousing sort of set up at yeah. home as soon as I Well, this is what we're doing at hospitals now. In fact, this is what I've told everyone at the moment when, because this is a calm before the storm. We're actually quiet at the moment. Most hospitals are quiet. So the psychology of what's going on in the community now is, is fascinating because the... the um, the extent of the measures that have been put in to try and control the spread have really spooked people. This is unprecedented what's going on. I think it's entirely appropriate, but it's unprecedented and it's made people stop doing a whole lot of things that we didn't really envisage that they would stop. Um, so elective surgery, you know, if you've been waiting for your hip replacement uh, or your hernia to be repaired, uh, even in the public system where the waits are up to a year or a year and a half and people have been booked in and they've been waiting that long, they've cancelled, which is a really interesting decision on their part. I think, um, you know, there's probably two or three things they could be pondering. One, I don't want to go into an environment where this virus is, so I'll stay away. Or two, they must be so busy, I don't want to um, take the space of someone that needs it. Yeah. Um, but at the moment, we're not that busy, you know. There's not that many patients admitted with COVID in the state. So we're <laughs> ironically, um, everything's gone a little eerily quiet for a couple of days. Is that a risk down the line for hospitals that, well, once this sort of, once the dust settles, so to speak, that people then start thinking about these things that they've put off and be like, oh, maybe I want that hip replacement. Or well, that. you hope it doesn't deteriorate to a point that it becomes an emergency. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I can only, I'm only making assumptions on their decision making, but it wasn't something we expected. Yep. We didn't think electives would start cancelling. Um, and yeah, I guess there is a risk that things will progress and they'll go, you know, we categorise elective surgery, you know, into three categories, category one, you know, we've got to do that in the next day or two. And there's category two where you can do it within a few weeks and category three, well, 
that can stretch out for months and months and months sometimes. Yeah. But um, you don't want a Category 3 becoming a Category 2 or a Category 1 just because of the the, the, um, the time delay. Yeah. yeah. And there must be a lot of misconceptions. You must have heard a lot of great stories of, of wives' tales, so to speak. What what are the the sort of most common misconceptions that that we're hearing because i mean it's getting shoved down our throats every day yeah on the news and how much of it's true what do we listen to or where do we source the best information from yeah uh, it's a good question there is an awful lot of information um i mean i've been drowning in in medical literature for the last couple of days <laughs> <Imagine>. uh, um, <laughs> And it's hard to know. I mean, the quality of it is variable. Mm. Uh, even within medicine, it's, it's um, hard to get good quality um, evidence around this. This is a bug that hasn't existed for that long. We're relying on the experience of China and increasingly the experience of Italy. There have been a lot of publications and a lot of um, work going on in lots of different centres and lots of emails flying from mm. intensive care units in Singapore and Italy through to us and colleagues who know each other across the, the globe, sending their experiences. So there's this um, almost tsunami of data coming through on COVID and what we should or shouldn't do um, as medical staff looking after people. Um, then there's the whole public health response, like what, what do you, how much do you shut down? When do you shut it down? Um, and what's the sequence of shutdowns? Um, again, there's not a, you know, there's no um, pure science in this. Sure. Um, this is a balanced um, decision-making process. And, you know, you live in financial markets. So you're, you're seeing um, the repercussions of this. Um, I'm not sure how much of that was predicted. Um, and um, and how significant an effect on um, you know the welfare of society that will become you know a lot of people I know are closing businesses they're telling all their staff to go home they've been told to go home mm. um, how long for how long is this going to last what's it going to do um, to people's mental health. Um, How's it going to affect you know um, society? Is a really interesting question. And then isolation is important, especially for the elderly. Yeah, they're the ones that are going to get hit by the virus the worst. Young people, um, children seem to brush it off without a problem at all. Right. Um, but social isolation for the elderly is a real problem. Yeah. It's a problem now. Yeah, uh, and we know it. It develops illness in them. Now, if we pull their grandkids away. Um, and for how long, um, I'm really worried about them. Um, and I think we, as a society, need to get quickly um, smart about how we keep in contact with each other and how we maintain social fabrics and discourse and you know, express all the love and happiness and joy that, that we need to do just to be happy humans. Um, you know, I don't. I'm I'm worried for the old who are going to be told to just stay in your home, don't go out, don't mix with your grandkids. Yeah. Um, for a short period of time, that's okay, but I'm not sure how long that will go on without them getting sick as yeah. a result. Yeah. So there's all these unknown consequences um, of isolation, but it is uh, the key to stop what everyone's been reading about in the media, which is this spike in spike. presentations. And um, so that's entirely valid. Yep. Uh, if you look at what happened in Italy, you know, they didn't really stick to the rules so well. Um, flaunted isolation probably didn't make it as strict or as detailed or as widespread as they should have. And um, yeah, you don't want to go into a hospital in Italy now, uh, yep. in Northern Italy. It, it's, um, it's disaster in there. Yeah, it's really rough. They don't have enough resources to deal with okay. what they're getting. They're making very hard decisions about who gets resource and who doesn't get resource. Oh, wow. That means some people are dying when, in all things being equal, um, there might have been an opportunity to save them. Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of situation we didn't want to get into. That's what all this is about. Yeah. 
Of course. It's kind of the only thing is to slow the spread so that it's a bit more laminar, a bit more plateaued, less peaky, yep. so that the healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed and crumble. Sure. And now, from my understanding, this has mutated once, if, if I am correct. Are we at risk of that occurring again? Yeah, I'm not a virologist. Um, okay. <laughs> from what I understand, viruses do that all the time, um, and all viruses do that. Sure. Um, and the clinical picture, you know, in China seems similar to the clinical picture in Italy and Singapore and Spain and England. So um, whether or not it's got slightly different RNA here or there, um, I don't think has actually altered its um, clinical behaviour. Okay. So I think we're dealing with one virus, yep. um, but I'm not a virologist. So sure. there might be a virologist out there who's cringing right now. So <laughs> apologies. Um, <laughs> Maybe you get a call tomorrow. <laughs> I might get a call tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> No, un understood. Well, it's, it's, it's very interesting times, as I said, and there's, there's so much to digress and to, to get your head around. But it, it appears as though the main picture is as long as you, you, you follow the, the regulations of, or the, the suggestions of washing your hands continually, keeping that safe, sort of safe distance away and, um, yeah, and, and approaching it in that sense, then we should be able to bring that, uh, that spread of it down. Listen, I'm hopeful. Um, uh, it seemed like we imported every single case uh, from overseas, certainly in my area. All the infections I've seen came from the United States. Um, right. And, um, you know, w the, the big question is, is that lag that we, you know, we closed the borders today, um, did, how many more did we let in in that week or two since we realised... Um, there were cases flying in, um, uh, and and that remains to be seen. I think our data now is probably five days behind the curve. So right, yep. patients are going to get symptoms. They're going to probably see their doctor on day one, maybe day two. They'll get a swab. That's now taking two to three days to come back. Okay. So w w we we kind of know. Our data now is probably what was happening five days ago. So that's probably a problem within itself, so to speak, or an issue within itself. The fact that that person may have come into contact with three, four, five, six the other people. Estimates are about 2.3. Okay. Uh, wow. Yeah. And then you Spread. The multiply effect of that could, could be yeah. significant. So the estimates you spread, a positive will spread to about 2.3. Okay. Yeah which is kind of like a doubling daily yeah. uh, type Whoa. behavior. Um, but I think today the cases in Victoria reported were less than the day before. Yeah. Now, if you've got good spread, uh, it should have been double. Yep. If you've got normal spread with that. So that's only one day. Um, we, may, we may see that um, change, it, that may be a delay in the testing, you know, there, there's not, there's only been one lab up until very recently, could only run about 1,200 tests a day. Um, there were some, um, you know, days where we were um, ordering 5,000 tests in the state a day. So, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it hasn't been able to keep up. There's some new labs come online, which is great. So it's really that turnaround time from testing uh, that gives us the real-time data, sure. and we'll get closer to the same day testing over the next few weeks, which would be great. Um, the test itself isn't 100%. Right, okay. Nothing is. Yeah, of course. Um, but there's talk of around 75% sensitivity, so 25% um, of the time it says negative, but you might be positive. Okay. Yeah, the earlier you do it in the disease, the more likely you're going to be in that 25% camp. Yep. Um, there's a very high level of anxiety. People are asking to be tested when they've got no symptoms at all. Yeah. Now, you can get a negative test when you've got no symptoms at all, but you still might have it and not and get symptoms two or three days down the track. Sure. Um, 
And similarly, if it's day one and you do have mild symptoms, the test may still be negative until the viral load gets high enough into day two or three. And you may then say, oh, no, I got tested, I was negative. So the test isn't perfect either. Okay. And the recommendations are if you're really suspicious someone's got it, you've got to have three negative tests over about a five to seven day period. Right. But again, that's putting stress on the Huge the stress. System. Huge stress on the system. Yeah. Um, so, the issue, so the intention is to um, dampen it down enough and have enough um, uh, known cases isolated for long enough that they don't spread so that the unknown cases or the missed cases um, are such low volume that it never gets to take off. Sure. And it's probably a good segue into the next question surrounding a cure or uh, preventative measures. Um, how does that landscape look now? Um, my understanding is that um, the normal process is they create a vaccine that goes through different stages of testing, mm. um, then that would lead to human testing. So that's a lengthy process. Yeah. Um, time is something that's not really on our side. Yeah, so I, I don't think we can, uh, for this particular phase of the spread, um, vaccines not um, our um, solution. Yeah. Um, Again, I'm not a virologist, sure. but um, my understanding is a year to 18 months is, is as quick as you're going to get something. Okay. Um, even if we pulled that back to six months, um, it's a bit late for this particular phase of it. Um, the treatments, I, you see a lot in the media around treatments and cures. Um, there haven't been any good randomised trials. Uh, some of them... Um, so have, that have suggested effect, you know, been using some of the retrovirals that are used for HIV because it's a retrovirus, um, coronaviruses, which are the common cold viruses, are retroviruses like HIV is. Sure. Um, so there's a thought if we can use drugs we know, stop retroviruses, it might stop this one. Um, some reports of success in China, but recently just some reports of the opposite okay. out of Italy, um, and um, there's some uh, old drugs, chloroquine, hydrochloroquine, which has been used for things like rheumatoid arthritis for a long time. Um, there's thoughts of combining that with the retrovirals. Yep. Um, at the moment, there's really very, very little evidence that any of them work. Yeah. Um, lots of other things been tried, from high-dose vitamin C intravenous to... <laughs> Um, Ginger's selling out in the supermarkets at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I bet it is. Um, uh, you know, it, when you're talking in medicine about evidence, you know, it's fairly stringent evidence that we apply, which is, you know, a randomised control, placebo-controlled trial that's prospective. So you get two arms of, of groups of people. You know, one group gets, well, they don't, neither group knows what they're getting, so it's blinded. Yep. Yep. Um, and one group will get the treatment and one group won't get the treatment and you'll follow them for a long period of time and assess them um, for all the different kinds of endpoints. Whether I mean, death is kind of a fairly hard endpoint that yeah. um, some of these trials aim for, but mission to ICU or recovery or um, uh, days of illness, you know, those kinds of things can be measured as well. Yep. Um, and there's uh, moves afoot in Australia to uh, have a big multi-centre randomised controlled trial. So we're going to run that at our place. Oh, wow. Um, and we feel that if you're going to treat something, you should really treat it under trial conditions because there's no evidence that you should be doing what you're doing. Yep. Um, and we figure that if we're going to get um, reasonable numbers through, we should, we should be part of the inquiry. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. When, when, when does that all start for you? Um, well, it's all in its evolution at the moment. I, th I think the ethics is going through it at um, Melbourne Uni shortly. Uh, yep. It's a big group, so we'll just be one hospital of many, many. Um, yep. But I think it's the right way to do it. Yeah. Um, and that'll, that'll really tell us once and for all. Uh, hopefully, you know, this will be the only time and uh, we'll get a vaccine and, and that'll be the end of this one. Yeah. Um, 
Got to be mindful flu season starting yeah. soon. <laughs> so get your flu vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> uh. You never know, maybe that could be you the preventative get, cure. You don't want to get both. You don't want to get both. Get no, both. Yeah. certainly not. One's bad enough. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, around that, there's a lot of figures out there that suggest that the flu kills more than um, COVID-19. Do you have any thoughts around that? Yeah, listen, influenza's, um, you know, a bad influenza season, and we, I think the last one we had was in 2017, was, uh, can be very dramatic. Mm. Um, and sure, we don't, um, you know, close down the world every year uh, yep. when flu comes, and flu comes every year. But there's a level of immunity in the environment, uh, within the group, within the community, I should say. Um, and there's vaccines. Um, and vaccines aren't perfect. You know, everyone's got a story. They had a vaccine. They still got the flu, sure. But it does make, make the flu um, uh, experience for anyone individual who's had the vaccine not as bad. So you don't get as sick or it can actually stop. You know, I think it's about 70% effective at stopping the flu. Um, so if we didn't have it uh, and the flu mutated as it does every now and then into a really virulent strain, well, yeah, we'd be in a similar boat to yeah. this um, because there'd be no immunity and there'd be no prevention uh, and it would it would uh, let rip. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a similar scenario, and um, you know everyone's talking about the flu epidemic or pandemic in nineteen nineteen or nineteen eighteen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that that you know we're not going to be uh, talking casualties like that. Yeah, um, you know, I think that was fifty million casualties. Yeah, um, different but again, stories. no vaccines. No treatments, no prevention, no underlying understanding of the um, the mode of transmission. Uh, I think a hundred years later, what we're doing is um, really based on a deep understanding of how these pathogens, you know, jump around and behave. So, I, I mean, I think it's fascinating times. It's scary for a lot of people. Um, I think most people should realise that they're going to be fine. Yeah. You're going to get, you're going to get it yep. and you'll be fine. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's a great message to, uh, to be able to tell the audience. Yeah. Um, you know, I do worry for our elderly population. Yeah, um, of course. But as you say, in the flu season, they're the ones that get hit and hurt badly too. Yeah. Um, and I do worry with them being isolated and I'd encourage everyone to make sure they ring and FaceTime and do whatever they can to um, keep their older relatives or friends um, in contact and make sure they know they're loved and cared yeah. for. I think that's really important. Also a great message, yeah. Um, but also know that you know you, you need to go about your daily life, you need to stay fit, you need to get out in the sunshine and exercise and you um, you need to enjoy your friends and your family. You need to do all those things. Yeah. Um, and they're really important too. And, and if you do get it, the high possibility is you're going to be fine. Yep. Um, and what you're doing by um, complying with all these isolation or, or, or social um, distancing requests is just allowing the healthcare system to cope. Yeah. That's what you're doing. I was uh, reading a great anecdote um, just today in, in one of the Bloomberg articles actually, and they were talking about how there's a community within America that are actually having dinner on their porches with their neighbours, but they can still all talk to each other and still be social without, again, being too close. Um, maybe that's something that we can look to look to do here, given that it's still uh, warmer weather. Yeah. Well, thank God it's not the middle of winter, because hey? <laughs> um, viruses like colder weather. Yeah. So, um, as a timing, uh, it's probably a, a better time. Um, but yeah, I, I, I um, yeah, I'm, I, the, the social behaviour um, of being asked to do this by a government. Uh, or enforced really yeah. to do this by government is fascinating. Um, 
and, and I'm not sure how it's all going to play out. I'm sure there'll be amazing examples of how people find a way of um, hanging out together yeah. without hanging out together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, it's interesting times. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm on the 50th circuit at the moment. All my friends are turning 50 and they're cancelling. Oh, their, no. Yeah, there's a number of parties cancelled. Um, it's it's sad because, yeah. um, you know, they're, they're pretty joyous times. You see people you haven't seen for 30 years. and Great milestones. Yeah. Too. So, but. I think the parties we're going to have when uh, when all this uh, disappears <laughs> are going to be pretty good too. Even better. Yeah. No, probably. indeed. Yeah. All right, Associate Professor Michael. Oh, we better not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've um, been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.